Welcome this morning to everyone in our audience. We are deeply grateful to have you here. Appreciate the spiritual interest that you've manifested on this occasion. And trust the day will be a great blessing to you. Every day, I receive a great amount of email. Recently, I was gone uh, about a week or so. And when I returned home, I had 268 email waiting for me. Many of these are questions that people have about things in the Bible. And whenever it's possible, I try to answer those. Sometimes it's a question that I can answer with a few words, a few sentences or so, and I try to do that. Sometimes it's a question that requires more than I can do briefly, and so I may refer them to an article, send them a link to an article that I've already written, or on occasions I will say, uh, that's a very interesting question. If you'll give me some time, I'll write something on that. It requires more than just a brief paragraph or so. Sometimes I follow the advice of the Apostle Paul when he said, Refuse foolish and unlearned questions, knowing they do often gender strife. So some I just delete, and that's the end of that particular business. A couple of days ago, I received a question that contained only five words, and yet it was tremendously significant. And the question was this, what happens to us after death something similar to that what happens when we die I expect that is a question that every single rational human being has contemplated at some time or another and at times, it becomes a more interest-intensing question than at other times. It's one that certainly could not be answered in a lesson of 30 to 45 minutes. But this morning, I want to share with you some ideas and some thoughts that I think might be of interest to you. Perhaps some help as well. When that question first came in, I said to myself in my own mind, well, I suppose the shortest answer would be, what happens to you when you die would be this. It depends on how you're living. But that really wouldn't answer anything for the person who has this question and it springs from a deep emotion or a missing dimension of Bible knowledge or a sense of fear or frustration or sadness or whatever. So it needs to be developed somewhat. If I may, let me sort of lay a foundation for a discussion of this from a very limited vantage point in just a few moments. That question cannot be answered without understanding something about the nature of a person, the nature of a human being. A human being is not just a hunk of flesh and hair. A human being is a complex biological entity that was made by God. 
Psalm 139, 14, I will give thanks unto you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But the human body is powered not only by what we call biological life, which is the kind of life that we have in common with all biological creatures. Dogs are alive, cats are alive, snakes are alive, bugs are alive, human beings are alive. There is a common biological phenomenon in living creatures that we simply call life. But there is more even to that resident in the body of the human being. And it is that which we call spirit or that which we call soul. Sometimes those words are used separately to reflect different ideas, but frequently they are employed synonymously, referring to the same intellectual, emotional, aesthetic entity. Personal entity, personality entity that dwells inside your body, that leaves the body at the point of death. It's called the soul or the spirit. It's that aspect of man referred to in Genesis 1.26 when the Bible says that man is made in the image of God. In the image of God does not refer to any kind of physical characteristics of God, but to a spiritual element, a spiritual dimension that is replicated in the human being. Not that we are God in this body, but there are some analogous conditions that parallel God as a part of the human spirit. And when this body, by virtue of time or illness or tragedy, breaks down so that it can no longer function as a biological mechanism, whether it's in infancy, adolescence, middle age, or old age, whenever that threshold is crossed, the spirit or the soul leaves the body, and the body is dead. Now, in terms of medical technology, the death is defined by doctors as a flat EEG for a protracted period of time. What's an EEG? Well, that's an electrical activity in the brain. And when the brain goes completely dead, the rest of the body cannot function and the individual is dead. It's not just when you stop breathing. It's not just when the heart stops because the heart can be revived, resuscitated. But it's when there is no further electrical activity in the brain for a certain period of time. The threshold is crossed and the individual is pronounced dead. In Genesis chapter 35 and verse 18, there is a case where Rachel, the wife of Jacob, was in heavy labor to bear a child. His name would be called Benjamin. And during the process of childbearing, while they were on their way to Bethlehem, the record says she died. And then there is an explanation for that. For her soul was departing from her. The Bible definition of death is the most precise definition of death that it's possible to give. Because when the soul has departed from the body, there is no power under the sun that can bring it back except God Himself. And He has done that 
on rare occasions in Bible times by means of a miracle. But it's not a common phenomenon, and miracles are not extant or operative in today's world. So nobody's being raised from the dead today. A similar New Testament passage is James chapter 2 and verse 26, where the inspired writer says, listen to him carefully now. The body apart from the spirit is dead. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead. You notice in Genesis 35, 18, the word soul was used. In James 2, 26, the word spirit is used. That's an interchangeable use of this thing within you, this real you. The thing that makes you the personality that you are, your spirit. So both Moses and James testify to the fact that when the spirit leaves the body, the body is dead. Now what happens to me when I die? Well, we know very well what happens to us in terms of the body. The body is removed from the premises where the death occurred. And it is taken to facilities that are able to prepare it for burial or cremation or whatever the ultimate disposition of the physical remains will be. And eventually, in whatever form, <clears throat> the body disintegrates. And the Apostle Paul says, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1, we know that if this earthly house of our tabernacle be dissolved. We have a building with God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And that building from God is not heaven itself, but it's a new body. It's a new body, a new residence for the soul. By and by at the time of the resurrection of the body. So we have <clears throat> knowledge of what happens, scientific knowledge, physical knowledge, empirical evidence of what happens to the body. You can bury a body and dig it up years later. Sometimes forensic pathologists do this in order to locate DNA evidence or other things that are apropos to the investigation of a crime. But the body goes back to the bosom of Mother Earth. As early as Genesis 3, 19, God said to Adam, From the earth or from the ground you were taken, and to the earth you will return. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, Dust returneth unto the ground whence it was taken, but the Spirit unto God who gave it. And that includes good spirits and wicked spirits. When a spirit leaves the body, it will go to God for disposition, for reckoning, for an assignment of a destiny beyond that of the physical. Well, what about this other instrument, this other element, this resident that lives within your body. What's going to happen to it when you die? Well, it separates from the body. And it goes into a state that you cannot examine. It's called an unseen state. You can see what happens to the body. You cannot see the soul when it comes out. I've been with a number of individuals when they died, and I can see what happens to the body. I have never yet seen anything come out of them, except the last breath that they breathe. I didn't see it, but I heard it. But the Spirit does leave the body. And it goes to God 
for disposition or assignment somewhere. Is there any word in the Bible that uses, uh, is used by the Holy Spirit to describe this unseen state? Yes, it is. Yes, there is. It's the word Hades. Unfortunately, in the King James translation of the Bible, that word is most often rendered by hell, which is not an accurate translation because there is another Greek word that is specifically designed for hell, Gehenna. And one other used one time, Tartarus. But the word used to describe the disposition of the Spirit, whether it's righteous or whether it's unrighteous, is the word Hades. And a number of Bible scholars, the etymology of it is a little bit in the fog, but generally speaking among Bible scholars, the etymology of the word that is the roots from which it derives means unseen. Unseen. When a good man dies or a good woman dies, you do not see the spirit leave. When an evil person dies, you do not see the person's spirit leave. So the spirit of either one goes into an unseen state, or biblically speaking, Hades. Now the word Hades is used ten times in the New Testament. We do not have time to explore all of those this morning, but let me give you two for an example of what we're talking about. In Luke chapter 16, we have the narrative regarding the rich man and Lazarus. You will remember that narrative. There was a rich man who fared sumptuously every day. He was clothed in purple and fine linen and had everything that he needed. There was a beggar that was brought to his gate every day and thrown there, the Greek text indicates, thrown at his gate daily. And the rich man, though he had much financial resource, cared nothing for this poor beggar. And so the beggar was left there to feign for himself or to fend for himself. And the Bible says the dogs came and licked his sores. Presently, the, the beggar's name was Lazarus. Presently, both of them died. And the Bible says that the rich man was buried. And Lazarus was taken by angels. And carried into a place of honor that symbolically is called Abraham's bosom. And that's an idiom which means the one who got to sit beside Abraham at a feast table. A very high place of honor. And the record says concerning Lazarus, he was comforted. There's a lot, lot in that. On the other hand, regarding the rich man, the Bible says that he lifted up his eyes in torment. And he said to Father Abraham afar off, Have mercy on me, for I am in anguish in these flames. The abode where the rich man was, if you read the American Standard Translation, is Hades. He was in Hades. He was in an unseen state. But he was in torment and wanted out. But he couldn't come out. It was an irrevocable punishment. Compare that, if you will, with a text in Acts chapter 2. Peter's great sermon on the day of Pentecost, especially beginning in Acts 2.22 when he talked about Christ and his death and his part in the great plan of God way back from eternity. And he goes on and quotes from Psalm 16, one of David's psalms, where David had prophesied concerning a death, that in this death you will not leave my soul in Hades. Nor will you give my flesh to see corruption. 
And the inspired Apostle Peter goes on to tell us exactly what that means. What does it mean, Peter? It means this, David was not speaking of himself. For his tomb is with us to this day. So he could not have had reference to himself because he talked about the disintegration of a body or the non-disintegration of a body. His body disintegrates. It's in the tomb. We know where his tomb is. The body under consideration here would not disintegrate. It would not rot. It would not deteriorate. And the soul of that individual would not be left in Hades. Peter then, without any equivocation, says concerning this, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Now here's the point I'm making. Where was Jesus' soul while his body resided three days in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea? David said, and Peter confirmed, that Jesus' soul was in Hades, the unseen state. Where was the rich man's soul after he died and his body was buried? It was in Hades. Both in Hades. We thus must conclude that Hades is a generic state for every soul or spirit after the death of that person's body. So you look out over the cemeteries of our community and those of the world. All of those bodies, millions of them, awaiting the day of resurrection. Where are their spirits? Their spirits are in that dimension called Hades, the unseen state. And if they died unprepared to meet God in that unseen state, they are being punished. And if they died prepared to meet the Lord in that unseen state, they are being comforted and rewarded. Now the Bible teaches, and we don't have time to develop this, but at the return of Christ, He will come back. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says... When He comes, He will bring the saints with Him. Isn't that interesting? Who are the saints? The righteous dead. The saints are those who were sanctified by their obedience to God, set apart by their obedience to God on this earth. And when Christ returns, what's He coming back for? To raise the dead. Raise their bodies. But he will bring all the righteous spirits with him. Now the text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 does not speak at all of the unrighteous. But we do know from other passages that the spirits of the unrighteous will re-enter their bodies. And their bodies will be resurrected. And uh, then disposed of in the similar fashion with the righteous only to two different destinies. Consider, for example, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Listen to the text. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, what is it about you that will sleep in the dust of the earth? Not your soul or spirit, your body. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt. That passage affirms the resurrection of both classes and the dis different destinies of each one. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, Hear me now. Do not be afraid of him who can kill your body, but cannot kill the soul. But be afraid of him who can destroy both your body and soul. In hell. And hell there is that eternal mode of punishment that is unending its, in its duration and horrible, too horrible to even contemplate. So that's a sort of a background platform, if I may describe it as that. 
before I want to develop some thoughts and raise some questions for your consideration. Now, I've got about five different points that I want to make. If I don't get through all of them, that'll be all right. We'll deal with it some other time. But I want to talk about some things that maybe you've thought about, maybe you've not thought about, but let's think about it for a little while this morning. I want to raise this question. You may think it's a stupid question. I don't think it is when you think about it deeply enough. Do you think that you will know yourself wherever you are? Or will you be a mere unidentified spirit or soul after you die? After I'm dead, will I know wherever I am, whatever I am, in the spirit sense, that I am Wayne Jackson? Or will there just be a number on me? Well, I want to just argue this point logically for a moment. If wherever you are, you do not know who you are. How could there ever be any kind of meaningful relationship between how you lived on earth and how you will spend your eternity? You bring up person X over here. He, let's say he doesn't know his name. Well, all right. Go over yonder to the place that burns with fire and brimstone into everlasting punishment. Why? Why? We can't tell you that. That's none of your business. You just go. Does that seem reasonable? It does not. There must be a mental correlation and awareness between your situation in eternity and your situation as it was upon this earth. There's a relationship there. Otherwise, if you're not going to know one way or the other, what motive is there in being obedient, being righteous, living godly in this earth if you're not going to know the difference after you die? Well, all right. I think probably we have agreement on that. Well, let me then ask another question. Suppose it is the case, we concede, that we will know who we are. After we die. Five minutes after I'm dead, I'm going to know, here's Wayne Jackson, and he's somewhere else. He's not in Stockton, California anymore. He's not on the planet Earth. He's in a new place. I'll know I am there. The second question then that comes to mind is this. Will I know and recognize and be able to identify... My companions, others who are there. Everyone I've ever known, I'll know them and recognize them wherever I am. I think you would probably agree to that. I'll argue that case briefly in just a moment. But I think you would probably agree to that. You surely... Hope that is the case, don't you? That if mom and dad died faithful, if brother and sister died faithful, if that sweet spouse died faithful, even though there is no such thing as marriage in the future world, as Jesus argued to the Sadducees in Matthew chapter 22, even though that intimate relationship will not exist, you want to feel like that you'll know them and be with them again and share memories? Surely that ought to be a part of heaven, of the eternal blessedness for the righteous. Let me ask you this question. Do you think that if you die right with God, and you go to be with the Lord, Jesus told the thief hanging by him on the cross, today you will be with me with me 
in paradise. Later on the day, that day when both of them died, you can logically conclude that the thief went where Jesus was, the same unseen state. Jesus had specified to him, you'll be with me today in paradise, Luke 23, 43. You can conclude logically that the thief would know later on that day that he was in the same place with Christ. He would be with him. Otherwise, Jesus promised to him meant nothing. Nothing at all. Do you think that you will know the Apostle Paul in heaven? Let me phrase the question in another way. If you will know whom you have known, will you know whom you have not known? I submit unto you that you will know everyone without having to be introduced. Do you understand that, Brother Jackson? No, I don't understand that. That's beyond anybody's earthly ability to understand. That immediately here's a vast throng of millions of people and you know every one of them by virtue of the power of God. Well, that's a wonderful thing to think about. Let me just give you a, a point or so here. In Genesis chapter 25, about verses 8 and 9, we read of the death of Abraham. Abraham died at the good old age of 175, Scripture says. And the record says, and he gave up the ghost. Gave up the spirit, which means the spirit left his body. That corroborates what we defined earlier. But then this puzzling question or, or statement is made. And he was gathered unto his people. Gathered unto his people. Well, what does that mean? Somebody says, well, it means they took him out to the old family burying place and plotted him there with his people. No, it does not. Because Abraham left all of his parents and kindred in a distant land, 500 miles to the east. And he came into the land of Canaan. His ancestors were buried, buried in a different place. When it therefore says he was gathered to his people, and there are a number of similar statements like that to, to other patriarchs in the Old Testament. Gathered to his people. It means something beyond the physical. He was gathered to his people in their company with them, identifying them, had a relationship with them. It's going to be a wonderful thing. Not only to have loved ones that we've known and, known and appreciated for so many years and to have reunions with them. Oh, how that cheers my heart. But family members who've obeyed the truth and lived faithful. Oh, that's a thrill to contemplate. But to know that you'll know everybody is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So there will be recognition of self-identification and of others after we die. That's a sweet promise. Then, secondly, let me mention this quickly. Your spirit or your soul will retain the ability to remember your life on earth. Again, I want to make a logical argument. If that were not the case, if you couldn't remember on earth and therefore why you were there, that, that would be a nonsensical situation. You have to be able to know why you're here. I obeyed God. I honored God. I remember the day I was immersed into the Lord. I remember praying to Him. I remember worshiping with the brethren. I remember sweet relationships in the Lord. I remember, I remember. Going back to Luke chapter 16. The episode with reference to the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was in anguish in the flames. 
And he cried out, Father Abraham, would you send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and come and cool my tongue? And Abraham responded, remember, remember, in your life you had good things and he was ill-treated. Now the situation is reversed. And he said, besides that, there's a great gulf between the two dispositions, between the two realms in the unseen world. And no one can cross from one side to the other. But I'm focusing upon the word remember. He could remember. And then subsequently he said to Father Abraham, I have five brothers on the earth. He remembered the number of them. He remembered the gender of them. And though the text does not explicitly say so, he likely remembered the condition of them spiritually because he said, would you send Lazarus that he might preach to them? And Father Abraham said, no, I won't. Because if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, if they don't believe the Scriptures, this is a, a powerful, eloquent testimony as to the nature of the Scriptures. If they don't believe the Scriptures, they would not believe even though someone came back from the dead and tried to tell them the truth. They wouldn't believe it. So we will have memory. Memory is a precious thing. Precious memories. The song goes. Next, let me make this quick point. After we die, let us assume that an individual dies and he dies saved and he is in a blissful, wonderful, happy state. Will he have any regrets? Let's reverse the situation. If an individual dies lost, away from God, hopeless, helpless, hapless, no way to remedy his pain, his suffering, his mental anguish, and he knows that there is an unending calendar on the wall. He'll never be out of it. Never, ever be out of it. Will he have any regrets? I want to tell you something. He will spend his eternity every day eternally regretting not having served God. Give you a couple of thoughts to store away momentarily. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible says concerning the second coming of Christ, Behold, He comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see Him. And they that pierced Him shall mourn over Him. There will be a whole eternity for atheists, agnostics, skeptics, and all of those who have emphatically repudiated Jesus Christ as the Son of God to regret their hatefulness, to regret that stubbornness, that hard-heartedness that so captivated them that they were incapable at a certain point of having anything but animosity and hatred towards the Son of God. Another passage complementary to that is the one found in Romans 14, 11, which describes the day of judgment. And it says concerning that great chorus that goes forth on the day of judgment, that every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow to Jesus Christ, to the Lord glorifying Him as the Son of God. Every knee, every tongue. That's a universal acknowledgement. But it won't be a happy confession. It won't be a joyous acknowledgement. It won't be a reverent bending of the knee before the majesty of our Savior. 
You ever thought about why there is that weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth in hell? I, I suppose that normally it's associated with the pain. It'll be so excruciating, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Let me tell you something. I do not believe that the pain is going, it's not going to be physical, I know, because there's not going to be any physical body. The suffering will be spiritual. The suffering will be mental. It will be emotional anguish at the sin committed upon this earth, at the rebellion against God. That is something that a person needs to think about the next time he's on the precipice of laughing about something religious and blowing his hot breath in the face of God. It is not a pleasant thing to contemplate. Well, I had a couple of more points, but my time is gone and I'm going to stop. You need a break, and so do I. Maybe I'll finish this on some occasion. These are pungent points, good brethren. Sober things to think about. As we close the lesson, we're going to...